his master's degree at Stanford in 1966 and 67, he and three other Chicano students pressed the Dean of Admissions for greater recruitment and admissions of Mexican Americans. When Sotomayor graduated and left to begin his career, the other three Chicanos continued their activism for a greater Chicano presence in the student body. In 2011, Sotomayor was inducted into the Stanford Multicultural Hall of Fame. Or it's Centro Chicano y Latino. I'm really proud that you did that. So, so the mayor received his BA in journalism from the University of Arizona, Tucson. And after a long newspaper career, he was inducted into the UA School of Journalism Hall of Fame. In 1985-86, he studied at Harvard as an Union Fellow. Sotomayor was a co-founder of three organizations dedicated to increasing diversity in the news media. He lived in Tucson with his wife, Barbara, a researcher for the book. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Los Angeles Times editor for 35 years and co-editor and writer of the 1983 Times series, Latinos in Southern California. The 27-part series considered a landmark in diversity storytelling won the 1984 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. His online book, The Pulitzer Long Shot, chronicles the backstory of the Latino series. In 1974, he authored Para los Niños for the Children Improving Education for Mexican Americans. And most recently, and what he's going to share with us today, and that we're so super proud to be a part of, is the writing of <clears throat> The Dawning of Diversity, How Chicanos Help Change Stanford University. Frank Well, it's so wonderful to be here. It is so amazing to see all of you here. Muchísimas gracias, Elvira, Margaret, Jacob from the staff here and with the assistance of Gina Hernandez. Thank you for setting up and making this event possible to Jose Perales and Ana Rivera. We had a little ad hoc organizing committee of uh, seven people, and we worked uh, on this panel, you know, kind of, kind of brought it to life from scratch. And I'm very happy that we're able to produce it for you today. So, Jose and Ana, thank you, and thank you to our musico, uh, Pete, Pete Perales, and, uh, and also, as you will see, the, the videotaping and photography by Jose Perales, Jr. Thank you, all of you. Todos los Perales. Gracias. Éramos siete. I feel this is a celebration for everyone who's here. I hope there are some Stanford students here. Do we have any Stanford students? Thank you. You are the lifeblood that keeps us going. And for all the alums, family, and other friends, thank you for being here. And again, it is your celebration. Now, I call in my book which you will see here, <laughs> kind of subtly placed there for <laughs> anyone, anyone that would like to play, uh, you know, place an order. I call this the trailblazer class. Why? Because for 75 years at Stanford, there has been non-diversity, non-diversity. Even to 1965, it was probably just a handful of, uh, of Latino, Black, Asian, and Native American students. In fact, when I was here one year, 66, 67, we counted names, surnames, in the student directory because the university said they didn't keep such records. We came up with about three dozen students, Spanish surname. Uh, 
we didn't distinguish whether they were from the U.S. or Mexico or, or South America or wherever. So we figured out, and again, correct my, my math, one-third of one percent. One-third of one percent of the student body was Mexican-American Latino. And I use the term Mexican-American in Chicago and uh, Latino because we're, those were the terms appropriate at that time. So those of you that like other terms, go, go at it. I'm very happy to, that right. you are uh, changing as the times change. But for me, I'm an old timer, old school, and I'm going to say what was appropriate at the time, which was Chicano, Mexican American, and uh, and Latino was somewhat used, but came to be used a little bit later. Pero somos uno. Somos uno. Yeah, we're, we're, we're together. We're together. Uh, I said there was non-diversity for 75 years. As some of you know, and some of you may not know, the first president of this university, David Starr Jordan, was a believer, an advocate, and one of the West Coast leading voices for eugenics. So this is where we start from. And I do trace that history in my book, which I found very interesting. And of course, people ask me, People ask me, who was the first Latino student? So, thankfully, uh, Advita and Frances Morales, uh, before her, did a lot of research. And they thought it was a person from uh, uh, Los Angeles, Helen. Uh, and through this, uh, what was her last name? Something like that. Okay, anyway, she was, uh, she was a graduate uh, about uh, 1911, somewhere in there. But it turns out, you you know, this is one of the incredible things about research. You never know what you're going to find. And I loved doing research. And my wife, Barbara, did uh, an amazing job of uh, researching. Well, Barbara is the one. Barbara, by the way, not by the way, but I want you to know, I want you to know, Barbara was indispensable to this work. So, uh, Anyway, someone wrote to Elka Marillo and says, no, uh, my, uh, one of my ancestors was the first uh, Latino that I know of. So who would it be? A distant ancestor of Hernan Cortez, of all people. <laughs> oh, so I don't know. We don't really mention Hernan Cortez very often here. In, Not a real great one. Especially in the... In this uh, in Centro Chicano y Latino. <laughs> but anyway, that's again where we start from. So, um, so why did I write the book? I initially was re re kind of uh, replying to Ana Rivera and Felix and Maria Gutierrez. I kept saying, Frank, write a book. No, no, first of all, they said, write an article for the Stanford Magazine. The Stanford Magazine had written a number of stories about African Americans. And very appropriately so, because they also were the trailblazers here for diversity. But nothing had ever been written about Mexican Americans, Latinos, and how they came to be a large presence, of course, now a large presence in Stanford. So I went to the magazine and I offered to write a story, and um, they said no, they turned me down. So I was not happy. I was not happy, so I said to myself, okay, I was going to write a 2,000-word article, so I ended up writing an 80,000-word book. <laughs> so, again, why? Why? Because these are stories that needed to be told, needed to be preserved, and we did not want them to wither away. And the more that Barbara got into the to the researching and to the interviewing, we realized that these are really amazing stories. And Barbara and I were inspired by these folks here and other folks that came before, even uh, people in class of 72, like, uh, like Jose Penales, Fred Alvarez, and others. And of course, those that came immediately after. 
uh, were also very much trailblazers in their own in their own way. All right, so that is why I wrote the book, and I think it's a, a worth a very worthy book. When I went to grammar school, high school, and even college, I never I never heard about about Mexican American uh, 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 history makers in the Southwest or anywhere. So again, I hope that. Many of you will write your stories. You know, mine is not the end. I hope it's the beginning of a flow of stories. Okay, enough for me. I'm going to introduce our co-moderators today. Happy to introduce, uh, first of all, Jose Perales. Jose entered Stanford in 68 and is part of the class of uh, 72. And... Uh, and he was one of the early founders and uh, presidents of Mecha. He went to the to the historic Santa Barbara uh, Santa Barbara Conference, Conferencia uh, for Chicano Studies. And uh, after Stanford, he went to law school at John Kennedy Law School and worked in the community college system of California uh, in a number of colleges. And ended up in a very important job of vice chancellor for human resources for the California Community College. And so thank you, Jose, for all you've done. And thank you for being here as a co-moderator. I'm happy to introduce another uh, co-moderator, a fellow Tucsonan, uh, Anna. Now, Anna came to Stanford as Anna Fisher. And days after... She left, graduated from here. She was no longer just Anna Fisher. She was Anna Rivera. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, married to this guy here, Armando Rivera. <laughs> so it does happen that uh, even beyond all the book learning, all the learning we learn from each other, some of, some of you folks, including Ida, Oh, their, their spouses here at Stanford. <laughs> All right. Um, so Anna Fisher, Rivera grew up in Tucson from uh, a family of educators. Mom and dad were both educators. Uh, her dad was a was a mail carrier uh, after a, serving in the Korean War, and he got enough money to go to the University of Arizona. Arizona, mostly on uh, at night, and earned a degree to become a teacher, later uh, uh, a principal. So following those footsteps, Anna came here. Of course, when she was when she first arrived here, she was greeted by the Stanford band and the Dollies, you know, at, at, at San Francisco Airport, and uh, she said, "Oh my God, right? Yeah, they do this for everybody." <laughs> Well, it turns out that one of her former boyfriends, sorry, Armando, one of her former boyfriends, is he here? Uh, hey! David, David, David Reese uh, was, was the lead trumpet player for the band, and he set up the, uh, the walk-up for, uh, for Anna. I would do that for everybody. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so you can see the bond that was built. The bond that was built for the years. So, okay. All right. Um, so, okay, so, so Anna graduated. Anna graduated here, got married, moved back to Tucson, and finished her, her doctorate at the University of Arizona, while Armando went to law school at the University of Arizona. And they went on to uh, successful careers in Tucson. Anna was a teacher, principal, and administrator also for the Tucson School District. So uh, we're very happy to have these wonderful co-moderators today. And I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. I have a panel of four, and I, I'm not, they have awesome resumes, awesome background. Awesome accomplishments, not just here, but also in out there in the real world. 
But uh, we're going to uh, ask them to tell their story. They're each going to have a five-minute period to tell us uh, their story. And I want to say, you know, they're, they're the four people that are here, and not to take anything away from them. There are many of you yes. that could be here. Yes. 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 So yes. many stories. Yes. Yes. So please get the book. <laughs> they're all in there. And, and uh, well, we're very honored to have them here. So we have uh, uh, Raymond Espinosa. We're going to start with him. Then we've got Dolores Reyes and, and we got David Stevens and, and Ilda uh, Cantu Montoya. Montoya. They really are all really close to me and to many of you. We'll get into the, into the panel. I would like to give Anna a chance to say something. Okay. <laughs> and I'm so pl glad that you're all here, actually. I'm delighted. But we would like those who did enter in the fall of 1969 to please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> of them, of the 70 that did graduate that year. But we just are really pleased and delighted that you're here to join us. Yes. We're going to start uh, here and go that way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Raimundo, uh, we have about five minutes to five tell us. That's it? <laughs> 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 and, we got, and we got the one minute warning and we have a couple of bouncers too. <laughs>
But she worked for Stephanie Citrus at that time, and her boss was a uh, West Point graduate, and she wanted me to get into West Point, so she put all the stuff together. I didn't know, and she just put this dossier together, all the stuff. And eventually, long story short, I got accepted. Uh, I was uh, nominated for Annapolis, but my eyes failed me. In the meantime, uh, during that period of time, my coach came to me, one of my coaches, and said, hey, go to the, uh, the office because there's a recruiter from Stanford and fill out an application. So I did, and I did that. And, and I didn't think anything of it, right? So I was already rejected from going to Annapolis. And, uh, then I got a call from Luis Nogales. Uh, oh, hey, man, you've been accepted to Stanford. I said, oh, okay. Great. <laughs> 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 <For money. laughs> yeah, there's some money. I said, okay, okay. So then I, everybody's excited at school, right? I said, why is everybody excited, you know? So I talked to my dad, and I go, Dad, Dad, you, know, you got to give me a, a coat, man, because it snows at Stanford. <laughs> back, back east. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so then, then, uh, then I okay, I, then I found out it was in California. So I was, ah. <laughs> but then I told this story uh, last night with. So I get the acceptance letter and it says Leland Stanford Junior University, and I go, what? I've been accepted to a junior college. <laughs> Army, SLA. Uh, they had just killed our super superintendent of schools then. Um, a lot of things were going on, turmoil, um, and drugs. A lot of drugs were happening at that time. I think, you know, one third of the high school was totally wasted, you know, in the classroom. You know, so reds, I think that was the big thing. Um, I knew in ninth grade that I wanted to go to college. You know, not sure at Stanford, because I never heard of Stanford. Um, anyway, and my counselor um, told me that, no, no, you know, go into the trades. That's, that's, what, you're, you know, that's what you guys are good for. Um, but in 68, like I said, turmoil, uh, we advocated at my high school, um, at my last year there, for Chicano studies. We had a white teacher teaching Chicano studies. Um, I did a, a report on Cesar Chavez. The next period, I was sent to the vice principal's office and reported as a communist. Now, that was, that was Chicano studies, okay? Never before ever was I referred to the vice principal's office. Um, anyway, so uh, in 68, there was a group called the Educational Guidance Center. They were from uh, Berkeley. And so they pulled me out, and a couple of us, and you know, said, we want to help you apply for colleges. colleges. And so where do you want to go? 
well, San Francisco State, San Jose State. Yeah. You know, I didn't want, I wanted to go local. Cal. <laughs> Not Cal. I didn't want Cal. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, UC Davis, um, but anyway, uh, so they said, hey, you know, why don't you apply for Stanford? Okay. Uh, applied and got accepted to all these different colleges. Stanford gave me a full scholarship. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So my brother, who was going to San Jose State, said, you don't want to go there. You know, there's nothing but you know, rich white people. So I said, okay, I'm not going there. Yeah. <laughs> so my father was sick during that period of time. My mother said, you don't need to go to college. Just be a secretary, get married, have kids. That's what you should do. My father... I, when I went to visit him in, in the hospital, said, you know, I was telling him that I got accepted to all these places. So then I told him I, that I got accepted to Stanford, and they were giving me a full scholarship. So he said, you know, I want you to go there. I said, why do you want me to go there? There's not but rich white students there, you know. And he said, well, they're giving you something I could never give you. So I want you to go there. So I accepted and as I was saying yesterday, um, my first week here at Stanford, I was ready to go home. I said, forget this place. I'm not, you know, I can't relate. I was at Lagunitas. If you've ever been there, you know, they serve you breakfast, lunch, and dinner with, you know, four forks and, you know, and all these things. And they serve, you know, the guy would come around and ask what you wanted to drink. So... I just said, no way I could do this. So Luis Nogales came and talked to me, and then he invited me to a dinner, and that's where I met 10 other Chicanos. And I was like, oh, my God, thank God. So Linda Lopez, who has passed away, okay, um, said, you know, because I said, I can't stay in my dorm. I cannot. I, I just can't relate. Uh, there was only one other Chicana and Rick uh, Perez, he came after me the next court. Okay. <laughs> he was there. So um, Linda Lopez said, well, you know, come stay with me. So I stayed at her dorm, on, slept on the floor, or slept in the lounge, and would go home, I mean, to my dorm room, change, and then move on. So that's how uncomfortable I was. Um, so anyway... Um, my activism, I think, we could talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so that's how I got here, and that's my story. And by the way, and yesterday, I, there were so many people I talked to that had so many interesting stories. Roberto Trujillo is collecting all this, all the information of Latino students. So if you have a story, write it down and send it to me. Thank you. So, how do you follow this? <laughs> you will. <laughs> yes, I will. Well, I'm so proud to be here with these troublemakers. <laughs> and they are troublemakers, but it's, it's good trouble. Your name? My name is David Stevens, and I'm from uh, Segundo Barrio in El Paso, Texas. Wow. And um, so I have a similar story. You know, I grew up six blocks from the border with Juarez, Mexico. Mm -hmm. Segundo Barrio is surrounded on three sides by Mexico. It's a very, very unique place in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the home of the Pachuco, the Pirilones. And I grew up with these people. And, uh, in, you know, I mingled with them daily when I was growing up. So I learned all that culture. It was a segregated neighborhood, as evidenced by the fact that when I came to Stanford and sat in my first classroom, it was the first time I had sat in a classroom with a white student uh, in my life. So we were 100% we were segregated, and um, one day the, the uh, Dina students came, and you know I was a I was a top student at the school. I had A's in four years. And I get to my senior year, and it's the first time the Dina students had ever talked to me. So they did not expect us to go to college. You know, 
We had 240 people in our graduating class. Ten of us went to college that year, and most of them were the girls. Ooh. The boys ended up in Vietnam. Wow. Yeah. And, and then all the females would go to, across the street to work at the Fada Manufacturing Plant. And that was, that was the body. So they didn't expect us to go. So I had, I had applied to Utah, UT El Paso, and no other school because I didn't know you could actually apply to schools wherever you wanted. And so one day the dean comes, he calls me, first time I've ever met him. He says, do you want to apply to Stanford? I said, sure, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I, like, like the Lord, I said, I've never heard of it. I didn't know anything about it. And I said, yeah, sure. So he arranged the meeting. Robert Anchondo came. He was from El Paso, and he was a law student here, and he came on a recruiting trip to El Paso. And I have to give him credit because he could have easily skipped the barrio school. You know, we were, and uh, Segundo Barrio was, at that time, the lowest income zip code in the U.S. I think it's still in the top ten. The lowest income zip codes. So we were poor. We went to school with poor kids, and they didn't expect anything of us. So uh, I give him credit because he went to the you know to Bowie High School, my school, uh, to recruit. And he could have easily skipped because there were all these other high schools in El Paso he could have gone to. So he came, and you know the rest is history. I applied. I was accepted. Um, Yesterday, um, Al Milo asked us at, at the uh, at the uh, at the book signing event, "What was your experience when you got here?" And, and most people talked about their social experience, and I have some of those stories too. But what came to my mind was my first day in class uh, at the university. Now I had been told that when you go to university, when you're a freshman. Most of your classes are going to be like 200 people in a big auditorium, lecture hall. And I get, I get to my first class, and it's a seminar. <laughs> Ten students, a professor, and the professor asks us to go around and introduce ourselves. So I find out one of the students introduces himself as the son of the Brazilian ambassador to the U.S. <laughs> Hispanic. <laughs> He, he, was, he was a Latino. <laughs> and um, one, of the, one of the females introduces herself as the daughter of a high-ranking UN official. And she was from, uh, from Europe. So I, suddenly I realized, you know, I'm not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> this was serious. And these people were talking about, with a professor, about some high-level concepts that I had yeah. never encountered, so I knew I had to get my myself prepared. And fortunately, uh, I had read a lot before I came to Stanford. So we'll talk a little more about how to prepare for university. So thank you. Uh, I'm Hilda Cantu Montoy from San Antonio, and I'm proud to say that I am the product of affirmative action. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not because I did not have the credentials. That's right. Yeah. We all here have the credentials, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I was uh, born in San Antonio, and both my parents were from the San Antonio area. Um, and uh, but none, neither one of them went to uh, high school or even junior high. They were fifth grade students, and I grew up speaking Spanish uh, at home. Mm -hmm. um, but my parents, for some reason, they always wanted us uh, to be educated. Uh, for them, education was graduating from high school, though. Yeah. Yeah. And so they said, para que tengas un buen trabajo, tienes que graduar de la high school. And so... That was how I started, uh, but I was always a little competitive. I don't know if you know that. But <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, 
I was always doing really well in school, and I always wanted to be the number one student in every grade and every class. And then in, in sixth grade, it was the first time that I even heard the word college. Uh, my sixth grade teacher said, uh, got a group of us and said, if you do well in, in your classes, uh, and, and you can get something called a scholarship, and you can go to a college. And she explained the whole concept of scholarships in college. And I said, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so that was my motivation to do, continue to do well. Uh, and I did. I went to junior high, which was in a very high-risk area where there would be paddy wagons outside because there were so many fights and stabbings. There was a murder uh, in my eighth grade class. Uh, and so there, was a, there were a lot of struggles. But I decided that um, instead of going to the high school that was closest to me, that I would go to another high school and I would take two buses, uh, city buses, to get there. Uh, but it was, I knew that it was a more challenging uh, class. And so I'm so glad I did that because I was able to uh, get recruited by Robert Anchongo. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, like some of these other folks here, uh, I did ex extremely well, but nobody ever told me that there were other colleges besides St. Carnet Burg and Our Lady of the Lake College, which were local colleges. And so I did get called in. Robert Anchonga told us all of, there were only like four of us. Uh, and uh, he told us all about Stanford. And I said, hey, <laughs> I want to go there. And so uh, he gave us a packet, the application packet. And that night I sat down at the dinner table and I started uh, working on my application. And my mom said, ¿Qué estás haciendo? And I told her. And she said, no, 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 te vas a ir. And then, and then, I, and then uh, my sister said, mom, it's just an it's una application, it's just an application, don't worry about it. And she go, and my sister goes, yeah, pero ya sabes quién es. And then she said, it's going to go. And so um, fast forward, I uh, did get that wonderful call from Luis Nogales, who's so special in many of our hearts. Uh, Luis Nogales called me uh, and told me I had been accepted, and I was so excited and so happy. Uh, by then, it was uh, I was working nights. I, I would work after school uh, from 6 to 10 p.m. every night. At the phone company. Phone company. <laughs> So he called me, uh, you know, I had to take the bus home from downtown, and uh, I got the call, and I was so excited. And it was so nice that a lot of the, because uh, when you ap apply to those jobs, you had to tell me you were going to go to college. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and so they gave me that job, but then everybody was very happy for me. Um, unfortunately, one of the person, some of the people that were not happy for me were some of the um, high school teachers that I yes. thought, right. that yeah. I thought, Loved me, right? Yeah. They were always so nice and everything. But when I got accepted, one of them came up to me and said, you're not going to make it there. Whoa. It's just too uh, hard for you. Whoa. And so it, uh, that gave me more motivation. Oh. More, wow. more motivation. Wow. So, so that's, that's how I got to Stanford. Uh, my dad, uh, at the time, they had to sign different things. The parents had to yes. sign different mm -hmm. forms, and, and my dad would not did said he wasn't going to sign something, but las mujeres came through. My two tias, who were actually his sisters, uh, were talking to my mom, and they said, you don't have to, you can sign. He doesn't have to be the one to sign. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, 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 so my mom signed all my papers, but then my dad started coming around, and, uh, but the, he did mention when he saw the, the, the letter, he goes, this is at junior university. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> okay, so anyway, like they said, there's a lot of things we became active in when we got here, but that's how it started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, that was just for us.
awesome stories. You know, so amazing, each and every one of them. Now, we're going, we're going to uh, go a little deeper with each of you uh, on a significant decision or contribution you made early in your Stanford days. So you can talk about the activism, but we have, we're going to start with something specific that we know that you worked on. Okay? So, first question. And the first one is for David. If you could talk a little about your leadership in advocating and negotiating for the Chicano theme dorm, Casa Zapata. Oh. Oh. Do the sitting down. So um, let, me, let me give you some context for this. When we arrived on campus, 70 of us, uh, we were spread out throughout this enormous dormitory system, residence system that's at Stanford. And <clears throat> there would be one student in a dorm, maybe two in another, if we were lucky, three in another. But we were just scattered. And actually, this place here has really deep meaning for me in, in Centro Chicano, because other than the students I met, Chicano students I met in my dorm, which was, there was like three of us, um, I met the bulk of the Chicanos here at El Centro. I remember meeting Jose Razo. I was one of the first people I met. And I met everybody here. And so this, this is a really special place. So I'm so glad that you know, with all the change that goes on in, at the university here, that this place has remained a, a bedrock of, uh, as a home for Chicanos and as a home for activism here. Anyway, so we were spread, spread out, and it was really difficult to meet other people. So over time, the Chicanos started complaining about being spread out. So Mecha uh, formed a committee in the spring, or actually winter of 1970, a few months after we had gotten here, to negotiate for what they call the Chicano theme house, or what we called, I think we used to call it a Chicano concentration house. Right. Where, Chicanos could go, <laughs> where Chicanos could go and be with other Chicanos. So we started negotiating, and after a while it sort of fell on me, because I remember sitting there negotiating with Larry Horton, oh, Larry Horton. who at that time was an assistant dean of residence. I think yeah. that's what he was. You know, he went on, a lot of you know him, he went on to higher, bigger things at Stanford. But I sat there, and I remember negotiating with them over and over. And um, we weren't getting anywhere. We kept insisting we want a Chicano-themed dorm, a Chicano concentration. And they kept saying, well, that's a good idea, but we don't know if it's a good idea, and so forth. <laughs> so one day I asked them, well, why, why are you so resistant? What's, yeah. what's holding this up? We want it. We need to provide it. And then he came out with it. He said, the university wants Chicano spread out so that the white students can have a, more of an opportunity to interact with somebody outside their culture. Yeah. Yeah. And I got really angry. And, you know, I'm a pretty calm person. But, I, you know, I almost lost my temper. And <clears throat> I told him, we're not here for the benefit of white students. We are here for the benefit of us. And we want a Chicano theme house. And after that, things changed. And we started negotiating in good faith. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of complexity to it. But the result was that because we had a group of students who were very active living in Muir House in um, Stern Hall and a group of activist students in Roble Hall, we set up those two places as Chicano theme concentration houses. So in a way, I'm sort of like uh, the grandfather of Casa Zapata. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that happened later. You know, a year or two later, uh, people changed it to Casa Zapata. But at the time, it was, it was a Chicano theme dorm in Muir Hall. And um, that was my part in kind of changing the landscape of Stanford. Thank you, David. Thank you. Whoa, thank you.
Thank you, David. I want to surprise David. This is a photo taken in the fall of 1969. David's in it with about seven other Chicanos who happen to be together. So there's a picture for David here. There's also Ray Espinosa's picture in here and Serra. So anyway, a very historic black and white photograph, and I wanted to give it to him as a gift. Oh, se puede. Thank you, David. That was really good, really concise, really to the point. Now we have the voters. The voters, we'd like you to talk about uh, your leadership uh, in uh, securing funding and organizing the Semana de la Raza, the first one. And maybe you could throw in a little bit about CEFA, okay. Chicanas for Action. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first quarter, my, my dad died, so I dropped out during that period of time. And came back um, next quarter. And um, Felix, you know, he was my rock uh, every day. I went to his office after class, and a lot of us did. And... Um, so anyway, um, we were talking about, you know, the movement, and we talked about um, Stanford and the Chicanos, and we were all separated at that time. So we came up with the concept, the idea of doing a, um, first of all, just a, a cultural experience. Um, it was going to be like one day, but then, you know, Felix, why, why not make it a week? Uh, okay, uh, so then we were brainstorming, well, you know, if we're going to you know, have a whole week, who are we going to have? <laughs> so we just dreamed, okay, what if we got Corky Gonzalez, you know? What if we got Dolores Huerta, you know, or Cesar Chavez? What if we got Teatro Campesino, Teatro Urbano? Um, all the, you know, then we, well, women's component, you know, so... It was like, okay, let's do it. So we just sort of planned out how the week would go. Uh, then we, it was like, okay, now we need to get money. We need to get funding. So Felix was like, hey, we just go to the different departments. They got discretionary funds, you know, so we can go and this one fits under, you know, social studies and this one fits under this and so on. And um, so Felix helped me and uh, write a proposal. And so, you know, we wrote this proposal together. Um, and then, you know, Felix pushed me, you know, pushed me in front. And I had to present the proposals to the different departments. And we got funded. And, I mean, it was amazing. Um, we had, I think, over a thousand participants from out of Stanford. That was the other thing. It wasn't just getting the students here you know, involved, but we invited the community. We wanted everybody to know that we were here. So we invited Bay Area, you know, so they, we had high school students that came in to listen to Jose Angel Gutierrez. That was one of the photos there. Corky Gonzalez came and spoke, Dolores Huerta. Um, the author of Campesino performed, the author of Edbano performed. That was Daniel Valdez's um, group. Um, and we were, it was like amazing. That's all I could say was amazing. We had mariachis on the white plaza. Russell, you know, took down the American flag. <laughs> <laughs> Put out the Mexican flag. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was, it was like, it was like I said, it was just amazing. And we scheduled it, you know, during, um, when people weren't going to class so much, so. So you people can participate. Actually, it was spring break, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so we got on the map, and yeah, actually, you know, we connected with a lot of uh, mechas in in the Bay Area, and well, even throughout California. Um, so that was that. It taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about um, how to, you know, organize, coordinate how to present, and um, not to give up, you know, just keep pushing. 
So I really learned a lot from that. Sefa. Uh, <laughs> so when uh, there's two groups, there was Sefa and then there was uh, the Chicana Colectiva. That came later. Sefa sort of sprang up in Mecha. Uh, in 1969, 1970. But Alice was the, I'm pretty sure, was the chairperson. Yeah, and Manny Cisneros was one, too, at, I think, when we first started. Um, well, you were co-chair with me. Yeah, I, was, I co-chaired with you. And that came about because they had the women doing all the secretarial work. Now, take, <laughs> let, yeah, take notes. Uh, could you take notes? And, uh, so... <laughs> Uh, anyway, so then, and he was going to talk about the comedor. Um, we were doing all the cooking, all the cleaning. I mean, we were, so it was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, so we wanted, you know, we're, we have power too. So um, we met the, a lot of the women and we formed a group called CEFA, Chicanas for Action. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, we presented to Mecha, and the men had a big problem with that. No, no, you're, you're dividing us. You're not, you know, we're supposed to be united. You know, uh, you you don't know, and so and you're you're a feminist group. You're like the white feminist group. No, 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 no. And we just kept pushing, and that's how I got elected co-chair. <laughs> Now, Hilda's going to add to this because she's going to be talking more about um, the Chicanas for Action and the Comedor and Soledad um, prison um, right. and, uh, and East Palo Alto. So she's going to just continue with this continuation of our women's role, role in our supporting our communities. So just a little bit about El Comedor, because it is an offshoot of, shel of shelter, as David spoke, and culture and politics that uh, Dolores spoke of. And uh, El Comedor was something that we all wanted so much, because unlike now, uh, you, we'd have to go to San Jose or Redwood City. There was a little place called Tony's, so we'd go on Middle Hill Road to, to get a taco once in a while. And so uh, we decided to seek funding again, like the Lotus did, and we were able to get funding for uh, to be able to have one dinner once a week on Saturday afternoon. And I can't remember the location, but it was one of the, one of the big locations. And so uh, every Saturday morning, uh, Gary Cavazos was a grad student, an uh, upperclassman from the area. And his parents would come pick me up at the dorm, and we'd go to Sunnyvale to a grocery store called Grisos, and we'd buy all the goods, and then we'd come, and they would pr primarily make the food, but I love, I've always loved cooking, so I was in there too. And it was just another way, another way besi besides all the things that these folks have been talking about that we could get together, because, you know, uh, what is what's that saying? Panza llena, corazón contento, right? <laughs> So, so that was one thing, but I think for me, the, uh, the big thing for me was uh, here, well, starting at co college when I got admitted, I started thinking more about injustice, and, um, and injustice troubled me. And so then when I got here and I started hearing all about, about these other things that people were doing, I really felt that I, was, I needed to become an advocate. And so I ventured into different things. Uh, so the Dot Prison Project was one where I went to uh, with another group of, of students as well to teach prisoners. Uh, there was another group I was part of uh, in East Palo Alto, and my daughter ended up teaching there and becoming a principal there uh, in East Palo Alto. Uh, we go there and, uh, and teach Saturday classes as well. And then there was, uh, there was also a very interesting group, thinking back now especially, uh, there was a big company in San Carlos, and they asked us if we could send students to teach the workers during their break times. 
So they would give work workers an extra 20 minutes, so they get like 45 minutes uh, every day, not every day, but once a week, and uh, they would come to our classes, and we would teach them English. So that was very progressive, right? Yeah. right? And so that was another thing. Uh, uh, Dolores mentioned Semana de la Raza with Jose Angel Gutierrez, and I had grown up loving history and democracy and government, and then uh, listening to Jose Angel Gutierrez from Texas talk about La Raza Unida, which was a third party that was gaining traction in South Texas, mm -hmm. where even though the population may have been 100%, or not 100, but 90% uh, Chicano, uh, the governing uh, officials were never uh, Chicanos. Mm. So they started a third party, and it was called La Raza Unida, and Jose Parales and I got very interested in that, and uh, when was it, my sophomore, junior year, we'd go to the different Newark, Union City, and other communities to, to talk to community groups about, about voting, about registering to vote, and, and voting, and becoming active, and, and using this vehicle of a third party uh, as a way to, to get elected. And so those are the kinds of things I did. And then, you know, the other big one that we all experienced was obviously uh, the Vietnam War. Right. Uh, we came here, again, very patriotic, and then learning about the war and how, how uh, Chicanos were dying disproportionately. And many were going there to Vietnam and returning and getting the wor worse wages than the non-Chicano uh, folks were getting. I mean, they didn't even go serve, and they were making better wages and with the same education, et cetera. So we be I became very anti-war. Uh, I had a half-brother that had passed away in the Vietnam War from a high school that had the highest uh, proportion of uh, fatalities of deaths in the whole country in San Antonio. So uh, I became a very active in the anti-war movement, and as a result, um, in, our, uh, in the spring of 70 is when Stanford got very active as well, and they decided to send a delegation of students, a cross-section of students and professors and administrators uh, to Washington, to D.C. to advocate against the war, and uh, we did. I had one little tiny little suitcase. I had never, that was my second flight, right? And uh, Alice had, uh, he didn't even have a suitcase. <laughs> he, he put everything in a pillowcase. <laughs> and, but, you know, we were there, we did our job. Uh, it was just a wonderful experience. I think that was, as the Lord has said, we learned how to organize, we learned how to advocate, we learned how to do. And uh, again, it's just not the four of us. It's right. a lot of you out right, there. Right, right. And the other thing I just want to say, I know it's more than five minutes, but during that time, the, the, everybody had a different story, was coming from a different place, was going through still a lot of things. I was, I was sending money. I would, I would work and send money home, right? <laughs> Which was the opposite of what other students were doing, getting. But... Um, you know, everybody has a different role, and everybody advocates in a different way. Some of the students that never participated in Mecha, I've read about them, and they've done wonderful things in the community. they become very successful. So don't feel, students, that you have to be one way or the other. Right. You use your own voice. Yeah. Use right. your own voice. Be your own person. Uh, one of the... Uh, professors in law school that I had, Marty Blake, he had been at CRLA, and uh, he came and taught a class on uh, on clinical law, and uh, he taught me that lesson because uh, he, he videotaped different things that we were doing in the class in law school, and he presented one videotape of a student who did a really good job, and he took like an hour and a half to cross-examine somebody, right? And everybody said, wow, that's great. And then he had, then he showed my video, which I was surprised, because my video was like 10 minutes long. And then he said, "That be yourselves. This, this shows that two different people were able to do their job 
in two very different ways, but they got the job done. And so don't try to, Ilda's more, you know, she's disarming, <laughs> she's going to uh, speak softly and just kind of get the person to admit all these horrible things. <laughs> and, and, uh, and this other person was more aggressive, and, and he's, he got his job done too. So again, I just really like to say that to students, because every one of you is different, and I don't feel like, and if you can't make it to Mitcham Leaves, that's okay, you know. You can't make it all the time because you might have other commitments. You may have family at home that's ill. You may have people that, you know, uh, you may be needing to send money home uh, at times yourself. So, anyway. All right. Thank you. decide uh, to go into the uh, health and medical administration fields. And you could talk a little bit about the gardener. No, no, so uh, um, my, my, my desire to work in, in, in the health field was as a result of uh, what I was doing when my, I was 10 years old, my mom was in a mental institution. Um, <coughs> And uh, I remember going to Norwalk and going to visit her, and, and the only way I could see her was behind the bars in the window, uh, my brother and I. Um, and so, and, the, and you know, as a kid, you, 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 and as a kid, you, you remember other things too, right? So we, my brother and I were all happy because we, we would go to the fountain right there <laughs> and get ice cream and stuff. But you know, I remember my mom; she was just just looking out the out the, out the out that window, and so that was. Part of it, but then at the same time, during that period of time, my, my sister became my mom. Um, but uh, she died of toxemia at the, at the age of 20, and so that had an impact on me as well. Uh, when I came to Stanford, um, uh, during my junior year, my sister committed suicide. She was 28, my other sister. Um, so those are kind of like the, the, the things that prompted me to. To be, I wanted to be a doctor, but but like I, I came to the conclusion that I'm not disciplined. Because now that loco aquí allí, you know, try, I, you know, following them, you know, yeah, you need some help, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> but, and like like I like I told, said last night, you know, the, I became a political science major only because at the last quarter I hadn't I hadn't declared and I had more poli sci I had enough. Poli sci units become a poli sci major, and I found a professor to sign my my documents that become a poli on time. I, I graduated on time. You know? <laughs> but you know, I had been searching for. Um, you know, I didn't really know. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. Want, I, I knew I didn't want to be a doc after all, and I didn't want to be because I had political science. You can become an attorney. I didn't, I didn't want to become an attorney because that was. I felt it was broken. The system was broken, and I was. Uh, you know, and I was like, oh, so but but just fate. You know, so my wife and I beat, beat, and I got married my junior year, and just by fate, check this out. We ended up going to Guaymas, Mexico uh, for our honeymoon, and one morning we wake up, and we go to this little restaurant in Guaymas, Mexico, and we, we see... Perales. No. <laughs> her friend. Her friend. Her friend who was in the uh, School of Public Health Hospital Administration Program. And he says, well, why don't you apply for this? I said, oh, what are you doing? Yeah, you have to run a hospital. I said, oh, okay. So I applied and I got accepted. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then I graduated in 75 and then took 10 years because I worked for different th different uh, organizations. One of them, my first job out of, uh, out of college, uh, out of my master's, was a hospital administrator, assistant hospital administrator. But the challenge was that it was in a planned community. But... Uh, which isn't bad, but you know, all the people, all the people I could relate to were out, right outside the fence, lived outside the fence, and so, and they worked, you know, in in, in the kitchen or in maintenance, and so I would go, oh, it's done cool. you know how I am. <laughs> so my my the the, the CEO said, he pulled me aside, he said, don't do that. <laughs> don't speak Spanish to him, okay? Don't be that way. Oh, you know, so, oh man. I go, at that time, I had a 41 Chevy, so I parked it in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't park here. 
<laughs> and I just quit. And I just said, no, it's not, this is not the place for me. And I, I, I kept looking. Because for me, after being here and being at Berkeley, it was about changing, and like I like to talk about, changing human condition, making it better for people. And, and so then I, from there, I worked for public agencies. The last job I had was working for a for-profit that, that grew from three hospitals to 30 in three years. And, um, and in, during that time period, that, that period I, I met this person uh, named David Correa. Uh, and he was a board member for the organization I worked for. And he was uh, the, the director of uh, Gardner, Gardner, Gardner Clinic. It was a small clinic. And he was leaving, and he said, he, caught, he, he kept in touch. He said, hey, why don't you apply for this job? And I said, oh, okay. He said, All right, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then, uh, so I applied. And um, at that time, my kids were tired of moving. They had moved every year. Um, and they asked me for a two-year commitment. <laughs> and they were like 9 and 11. They were 9 and 11. <laughs> yeah, give me a two-year commitment. Come on. <laughs> I said, okay, you know, I said, I'll do it, I'll do it. No, no, so, I, you know, as I, I got to this place, and it was, like, small. It was, like, our budget was, like, $2.5 million. Oh, man, it was, a, it was interesting because um, community-based, it had been on probation, uh, and, and, and it, we were, like, poor, like our, like, our, like our clients, right, like our patients. We were just, like, pobrecitos. You know? That's how we, I mean, I had, I had a... And people still remember it because there's some people that are still there that would, they would tell our funding sources, don't don't mail the check. <laughs> we'll pick it up because we've got to meet payroll. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, and boys, he thought the employees would run to the bank. <laughs> 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 but as he, but and then and then it was interesting because it was like a, people hadn't built, you know. And, and then there was platos and then the th th builders, so they were from different countries that had platos back home, and they wouldn't talk to each other. <laughs> so, you know, so I had to kind of like get everybody to organize together, and I said, you're not canceling clinics no more. And, and finally, you know, uh, a, a, a story, um, things happen, right? So the person that played at our wedding, his name was Gilbert Servin, uh, he, he was in the band. So he played football. He came, when I saw him in, at, in, in uh, San Jose at that time, he says, he was a consultant, right? And he goes, hey, Raimundo, man, why don't you buy your building? And I said, no, man, that, that might be a good idea because if I can control my costs, maybe I can make it better, right? And, and he says, yeah, because, you know, all the hospitals are taking advantage of this, quote, unquote, tax exempt bond financing process. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I said, okay, well, okay, well, okay. So you write the proposal, and but you got to get 180000 I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. We didn't have any money, right? We didn't have any money. And so, so finally, I, there was this program from the city, uh, CDBG, Community Book uh, Development block grant funding, and it was to eliminate blight. Right, we're in America. We, our, our our philosophy was to, to build in the barrio so that people would walk to the to the places. Right. So I went to the city, and the city goes, "Nah, you shouldn't apply because uh, we don't fund health care." And I said, "Oh man, but we're blighted, you know? Come on!" <laughs> so I did. I applied, and I got a hundred thousand. You know, and um, so I still needed eighty thousand. What? what am I going to do, man? How am I going to get this money? So I just, and I said, ah, you know, also, I have a habit of waking up in the middle of the night. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> so I said, you know what? I'm going to ask the owner to donate it. And uh, I remember we went, uh, he lived in Aptos, and we lived in, uh, we were in San Jose, and we met at the top of the hill. I said, come on, man, donate it. Now. Come on. And he goes, and I go, yeah, because you'll get 1.3 million. <laughs> so donate it. <laughs> he said, that's a finder's fee. I know, I found you. <laughs> 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 so so that started the whole the whole process, right? And so so uh Viso, uh, so so then I was there and I left and I worked for this other place called Alviso, which was the first federally funded health center uh in the state. California in 1968, and that was developed because when it was when this was the Valley of Hearts Delight, 
migrant workers would go to Alviso and the population would du double in the summer and they had no access to health care. Two years later, Gardner also, uh, because of the cannery workers, the service workers, uh, organized in the Gardner community. In 1997, we brought them together to make one. But uh, so we grew over time from a $2.5 million corporation to a 90, $93 million corporation. Wow. With, uh, eight, yeah. sites, uh, eight sites, and we own um, six of them, and five are debt free. Wow. wow. <laughs> and the, the most important thing is that we provide a lot of service. You know, 46,000 people. We provide medical, dental, optometry, pharmacies, um, health care services to the homeless, um, a big behavioral health program. Um, so that's the value. That's the value. It, it, it's not about things. It's not about the fact. It's about what you do. And uh, what I'm really proud of, I think, is in terms of the culture, is that because uh, the people that we serve, it's a family of four making forty-five thousand dollars a year. That's ninety percent of our people. Wow. You know? And um, the thing that I love, and, and uh, is that they'll help you. That that's the main thing. And I said, as long as you keep helping people, people will come back. Right. As long as you keep helping, they'll come back, and that's how it should be grown. So. The, but the but the impetus for me wanting to be in the healthcare field was that to create human to change the human condition, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so they were working as cooks, they were working as service workers, they were working as gardeners. They were here, but they were and I remember in the dorms, I would always talk to the you know, some of the food service workers were were Chicanos, and I would talk to them. For the white students, they were invisible. I mean, they didn't exist. They didn't mistreat them, but it's like they weren't of consequence. And so what, one of the things I did was um, I didn't like how the administration treated them. They treated us royally. I mean, even the Chicanos, we got treated well. But um, the workers got treated poorly. So I went to work with a union here and work to organize. So um, I worked as a you know field work as a, a business agent. I worked as an organizer at Stanford for 12 years. Um, I became union president, uh, and I I was just you know I did everything in the union field you can do. Um, so and one other thing I wanted to add was um, I was part of. I was one of the founding members of Dr. Loco's Rocking Jalapeno Band. Wow. <laughs> and a lot of people don't know it, but this, that band started here at Stanford. Yes. Yep. And, um, you know, part, part of that, we have uh, Carlos Campis, who's somewhere back here. Francisco. Back there somewhere. Francisco. There he is. Oh. And, yeah, he was the original timbalero for the band. And, uh, you know, Gina's husband, uh, Chris Gonzalez Clark, was a guitar player. And I played with the band for 14 years. Yeah. And, you know, one of my joys was playing at the Zoot Suit Week yeah. dance Zoot at Zoot. Casa Zapata because it brought me home. And we did that for a number of years. And, um, you know, I got to, through that experience, we got to play for generations after us of uh, Chicano students and got to know them. And also got to know uh, Jose Antonio Buciaga and Cecilia. But Jose was, um, he was from El Paso. So we had a connection. And uh, so I just wanted to say that, you know, I, this place holds a lot of meaning for me in terms of things I've done. And just, just sort of to wrap it up, um, uh, I'm a special education teacher. I teach um, students with learning disabilities at Ida B. Wells Continuation High School in San Francisco. Been teaching for almost 30 years. And um, after I left Stanford, I got my uh, teaching credential, master's, and uh, doctorate at the uh, University of San Francisco. So I'm all tied up with this area, and I'm just really happy to be here with these folks. Can you imagine their energy when they were 18? <laughs> And it was amazing, and you know, Hilda was one of the fiercest uh, 
advocates for women's rights back when we didn't really get it. And I really feel sorry about that, and I apologize. You, you know, the guys, we didn't get it. We were supportive, but we didn't get it. So you left taught us a lot. Come on now. And these two, yep. one of my joys, one of my joyous memories from when we were freshmen is watching them dance with abandon and joy to slime the family stone. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Jane Hernandez, um, proud Chicana, proud Machista, current um, senior at Stanford. First of, first of all, congratulations for making it out of Coachella Valley. It's a little inside joke we have here at Stanford, Coachella Valley people. Uh, um, but I know like maybe to Gina, I mean, I already sound like a broken record, but I just want to thank you on behalf of all the students here because without any of you, any, like doesn't matter if you graduated last year, Students like me could have not been here. So oh, yeah. just thank you from the bottom of my heart All for right. paving the way. Uh, All right. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists, to uh, Anna and Jose for a wonderful program. Uh, I'm sure they could have gone hours and hours, you know, and uh, I think uh, Raymundo would still make us laugh. Oh, I Okay, there's so much that could be said. Let me see if I can make a few wrap-up comments. One of the things at the beginning, and I want to pay tribute at this event to some of the early people who were here uh, and made possible the entry class of 69 which became the graduate class of 73. We have to start with Luis Juanes. Yes. Luis Juanes was born along the Highway 99 near Madeira. They were farm workers, family was farm workers, and never traveled to another camp when, when he was born. His grandma brought him to life. Anyway, from this background, he came to Stanford as a law student, and he was a leader. He was a leader of the Chicano movement, which was just starting here at Stanford. And he was the one really that I worked with and Robert Anchondo and Frank Posey worked for for a year. Now I moved on, I had my degree, I had a job, so I moved on. But it was Luis and Frank Ponce and uh, Robert Anchondo who kind of took over from there in the year of uh, 67, 68, that made the class of incoming class of 69 possible. So I want to remember that. And from the first administrators at the group, we again need to pay tribute to Felix and Maria Gutierrez. They were fantastic. One of the things that Luis really believed in, and I think one of the reasons that he chose a class like this, of people that were interested in doing things for the community, in making a difference, was this. They were not looking for people that were looking, saying, what's in it for me? What's yeah. in it for me? Yes. They were looking for people that were saying, what's in it for us? for the Chicano community, the Latino community, for the general community, for everybody. And I do talk, I do talk in the book here, wrote about some of the things that they moved on beyond these folks. And you can see that they went into the, what I would call helping careers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and so forth. So that was the whole idea. So it wasn't just to get a degree. It was to make it uh, more of a general change in society. Yeah. So um, I remember a few years ago, uh, and I was lucky to be inducted into the Hall of Fame here. It was a great honor for me in, uh, in uh, 2012, but I didn't come to any reunions for a while. So I came back in, uh, in 2018, and, uh, and someone told me something that just kind of knocked me down and brought tears to my eyes. He said, we now have 
more than 10,000 Latino graduates at Stanford University. Wow. I had absolutely no idea. And when I heard that, I was just kind of silent and kind of cried tears of joy for that. So uh, on that note, as I said, this is a celebration for these folks. This is also a celebration for you. So enjoy, remember, but also give back. Also give back, okay? The undergraduate enrollment here at Stanford of, uh, of undergraduates is pretty good. It's around 18% right now. It's pretty good, but that has to continue to rise as the Latino population rises. The thing that is a disgrace is that it drops down to 8% graduate students. And even beyond that, only 4%, only four of every 100 faculty here are Latino. And Latina, so when I say Latino, definitely, of course, mean Latino and Latina. So this is something that, that you in your small groups can, can think about. What can you do? I tell you that letters are extremely effective, extremely effective. You think, oh, no, they're not going to pay attention to that. Stanford's in the transition right now with a new president going to be coming in. So this is a very appropriate time to write to the president. The provost is uh, Jenny Martinez. Uh, you know, another just coincidence, her father was a, was a visiting lecturer here in sociology when these folks were right here. And he was a guy, he was a person that basically got rid of a fito bandido uh, in the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the bandit that would be uh, in the advertisements for Frito Lay. So anyway, uh, okay, so my final message is enjoy, but remember the students that are here now and the students that continue to come here. It's just not for a selfie reason for us Latinos. It's to make our country better. You know, when we have when we have a Javier Becerra in the national government, when we have the two Castro brothers, when we have uh, Ellen Ochoa as an astronaut and head of a of a, of a NASA Johnson Center, uh, these are big time players, and there's so many others, and we need to continue that. People that understand our community. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. We want to thank Frank uh, for his comments, for his book, for his great contribution to our history. Uh, it'll be there forever. And uh, we appreciate everybody. It's just so, such a big crowd. We, we, uh, we weren't sure because it was Saturday morning, right? So, <laughs> thank you for making it. And then our panel, just such an amazing, can we give them a hand? Thank you.